Hello, everyone. My name is Katrina Lashley. I'm Program Coordinator for Urban Waterways at the Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you so much and welcome to um, the first lecture in our Summer Well Lecture Series at the intersection of gardens, culture, and style with public horticulturalist Abra Lee. Um, thank you for spending a portion of your Saturday with us. I'm very excited to have you. I want to quickly give you um, an overview of the agenda. First, I'm gonna place um, today's um, lecture in the context of the museum's ongoing environmental work. Then I'm going, we're gonna move into um, the lecture portion with Abra. And finally, at the very end of today, we're gonna to spend the last 25 minutes or so in conversation with each other and with Abra as well. And so in terms of interacting today and rules of engagement, you have two options. If you'd like to ask a question, you can type directly into the Q&A panel. Or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and my colleague Janelle, I will um, unmute you and you can ask, answer your question directly um, to Abra or to um, the production team. So once again, we will also have the chat open if you'd like to share any other comments or engage in conversation with your fellow attendees. Um, Janelle will also be posting any resources and links as the conversation continues. So we're very, very excited to have you along. And so we're gonna um, dive right into an overview of the work we've been doing for the past decade or so. Today's lecture, Women's Environmental Leadership Initiative, comes out of the ongoing work of the museum's um, overall project, Urban Waterways, that for the last decade or so has been documenting and researching the relationship between urban communities and their waterways. Um, we operate from the standpoint that urban rivers and their communities are not only physical space, but also various pasts, obviously the present and possible futures. And so we're talking this idea of a relationship, we should explore this ongoing history through multiple lenses, multiple pathways. So um, ecology is important, chemistry is important, marine biology is important, but also looking at the lenses of history, culture, faith, race, class, power, waterfront development, the whole list. And I would say a, a reoccurring sentiment um, that's kind of popped up in our conversations, both locally in DC, for partners in LA, along the Gulf, Oahu, London, Louisville, Pittsburgh, is that water is life. Water is everything. And that when we're looking at these waterways really is um, an entryway into the conversation in terms of our ongoing relationship with the environment as communities define the environment in multiple ways, how they're willing to engage the environment in multiple ways and how they have been engaging in environmental issues um, over the course of decades. And so the museum's role really is to kind of be a part of these conversations, to document these conversations and to document this ongoing history. And as we were doing the work of urban waterways, doing programming, research, oral histories, we're meeting many women who were part of these environmental spaces, who are leading these environmental conversations and these spaces, um, and who in many ways through their work have defined or pushed definitions of environment, environmentalism. So the women are at various stages of their career. Some are just starting out, others are midway, and others have been doing this work for 45, 50 years, um, who were the first in these um, environmental spaces, um, who kind of challenged the traditional green movement, for their lack of um, diversity, their lack of inclusion, who helped to frame and shape the current EJ or environmental justice movement as we know it today, and who have affected change at both local, national, and international levels. And so regardless of where they are in, in terms of their work, these women really have continued to shape, their, in many ways, the embodiment of this um, environmental history that really has documented how communities continue to define and advocate for the environment as they see it, as they experience it. And so the goal of WELL really is to kind of create um, a capacity for women's environmental leadership to bring women together in conversations um, to meet as people, as professionals around the themes of mentorship, education training, and leadership as it can be enacted. So in this process, we see ourselves, the museum, as a convener, as a resource, um, as fortunate enough to document this ongoing history. And so we launched in 2018 with WELL, which was um, National Summit, Summit. We've continued over the years in terms of building our programming. Um, we have workshops, we have different discussions, oral history, um, in 2020, we published our first volume of Women, Environmentalism and Justice, aimed at um, late, middle, early high schoolers to kind of document and share the stories of women involved in these environmental spaces and arenas. We plan to continue these oral histories and to continue these volumes of publication. We hired in April our a curator of women's environmental history, and we're working toward in 2023 our year of the environment with another exhibition from the project looking at women of color and their role in the environmental justice movement. Um, and so in last fall, as along with everyone else, really, we kind of shifted to a virtual platform and we launched our Well Lecture Series. And the goal of these lectures is really to give you an opportunity to meet the women um, in these various spaces and to kind of understand how they work, how they engage the various communities, how they define their environmentalism and kind of watch shape the definition 
um, their definitions of environment, their definitions of justice, and their definitions of civic engagement and um, community service. And so I first met our today's speaker, Abra Lee, as we were taking part in a conversation, a panel last um, December, um, SI Gardens uh, put on a panel called Gardens of Resilience. And as we were in conversation with my colleague at Smithsonian Gardens, Cindy Brown, I realized that Abra really was the embodiment of the work that we hope to document, the work that we hope to provide a platform for um, in terms of her personal and professional, um, I would say, experiences. I think it's very important to understand that um, through her work and through her expertise, it really serves as a reminder of the legacy of stewardship, kinship, and joy to be found in the ongoing relationship between the natural world and communities who are often, when it comes to certain environmental spaces, um, have been overlooked or have been labeled uninterested. Um, I think her experiences point to all an alternative narrative, one of connection, of expertise, and access. And so for the next two hours, we're very fortunate really to kind of have her guide us through the process of her, I would say, stepping into fully realizing her personal, cultural, and ecological um, heritage, how that's impacted her sense of self, her connection to place, um, her personal professional work, and how she engages and collaborates um, with her larger communities and with her colleagues. And really how her engagement, how her environmentalism can serve um, as a model for how we go about our works in our own communities and how we can apply some of her approaches and her experiences in um, the work that we do over time. So we're gonna meet her in a second. I wanna give you a very quick general overview and then um, pass the stage on to Abra. So Abra Lee is a national speaker, writer and owner of Conquer the Soil, a platform that combines black garden history and current events to raise awareness of horticulture. Her experiences include serving as a municipal arborist, extension agent, and airport landscape manager. She's a graduate of Auburn, Auburn University and an alumna of the Longwood Garden Society of Fellows, a global network of public horticulture professionals. Abra, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome, Katrina, and thank all y'all for being here today. Um, I wanted to let you know before we start, this is I am a, a casual, approachable person in real life. I'm uh, certainly not um, someone that doesn't um, engage in everyday conversations. So if you have any questions while I'm talking, while I'm speaking, I'm happy to reference the chat. And I think that uh, earlier Katrina or Janelle talked about raising your hand and please share, because sometimes it's hard to go back to slide number 20 and you have a question on that. And with this, we will get started. I'm gonna go on and share my screen. And um, I hope that y'all can see that. Is that, yes? Okay. Yes, we can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right, well, we're gonna go on and get started. Oh, sorry, y'all, this is the, I'm at the end here. Um, let me stop my share. Give me one moment, technical diff They said that Mercury is in retrograde and I believe it because this is the end of my slideshow. So let me get to where I'm on my first slide. I apologize, y'all, give me one moment. Oh, okay, let's see. Well, one last go here. Oh, okay, I got it. There we go. From the beginning. We are there. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your kindness and your patience. And I'm going to just go on and get right into it. My, when Katrina and I were discussing this, I talked about me getting to this place now where I am self employed, I work as a full time horticultural consultant with uh, public gardens, with museums, with arboretums, anything that we would call a cultural institution. And it is because looking back on my past, I grew up in two worlds. And I'm going to start off talking about the first world I grew up and then also the, the second world. So the context is this, my family is from Atlanta, Georgia. My dad is a uh, fourth generation Atlanta. And I'm a fifth generation Atlanta. So we really, really been here. However, on the weekends, we would go down to Barnesville, Georgia. That is my mother's hometown. And um, Barnesville, when I tell you it is the dirt road country, it is literally a dirt road country. And their biggest claim to fame is buggy days uh, because Barnesville was popping back in the day when the horse and buggy um, was a thing. And so you, it can just tell you how long ago that was. However, 
the beauty of that is that it takes you back to a place where you have to stop, you slow down, things are manual. It wasn't just the speed and fast and just go, go, go lane of Atlanta growing up. And those were the start of my horticultural roots. This is my mama. And this is at the family farm in Barnesville. Uh, and you can even look at the picture. In the back of the picture, you see the row crop agriculture there. And this is her on her graduation day from high school in Barnesville, Georgia in 1959 uh, in the United States. And I'm going to show you something that is almost an identical uh, to that picture. This is me. I'm the little girl holding the Easter basket. It is Easter Sunday in Barnesville. And if you look, the yucca plant that my mom is standing next to on the far right, you'll see this yucca. It looks like there are blooms on it. And actually that is um, the Easter egg, um, the egg crates. My family was very big in the yard art. And as uh, Zora Neale Hurston described it, decorating the decorations. And so they would take the ends of the egg cart and put it on the yucca and change the color out um, all the time, all summer, spring, whatever. It would always have these blossoms on there. And this would later on impact me and the way that I interacted with people in horticulture. And it also was a way that I really got set straight um, and trying to, I wouldn't use the word abandon, but there was a, a time that I wanted to correct the things that I had learned in my childhood because I learned better things at Auburn. And I found out that not necessarily to be true. Another part that we didn't mention in the intro is that though I grew up with this farm and agriculture family, really proud Georgia roots, a very successful family farm. My father growing up when I was a child was the director of parks for the city of Atlanta. And I didn't really compute when I was five, six years old that you could grow up and be a parks director. In my mind, he was just my daddy. And I never thought about his job being my job. And some context there, he was the first Black director of parks for the city of Atlanta. He was appointed to that role by Mayor Maynard Jackson, who was the first Black mayor of Atlanta. He was elected in 1972. And my dad joined his staff um, some years later. And they actually also grew up together, uh, which was really cool. They, they ran in similar circles, I should say. I'm not saying they were BFFs, but they definitely uh, knew each other. And my dad never sought out to be uh, in these public spaces. He was just a, a gentleman that was involved in the civil rights movement. He had earned a law degree. He had gone to Morehouse, gone to Georgia State and gone to John Marshall Law School. And Mayor Jackson needed someone that he could trust on his team. We have to remember that this is a time in Atlanta when missing and murdered children were going on. So it was a big deal. And he chose my dad to be the leader of his parks department. And my dad took it upon himself to go back and get horticultural training at a community college in Atlanta. So I mentioned him in this parks work and on the weekends, I would ride with my father as he did his rounds throughout the city of Atlanta. So whether this was Southwest Atlanta, Northwest, Northeast, that's how we do it down here. We talk about the, the quadrants of the city. I spent my weekends when I wasn't in Barnesville, I was with my dad in these beautiful parks. And this one on the left is Piedmont Park. And again, just hanging out, not knowing any better. They talk about Atlanta being this city in the forest. And there's a lot of tree canopy here, though we've lost a lot over the past two decades. And also another place that he would take me that was incredibly impactful to my life was Oakland Cemetery. And Oakland Cemetery is uh, really probably one of the first public parks in Atlanta. It's open 365 days a year and it was built during the Victorian era. So that means that this is not a cemetery that's just grass cut and headstones. This is a cemetery where virtually anything goes and all the headstones are different. Many uh, famous Atlanta people are, are buried in this cemetery. Mayor Jackson, who I mentioned earlier, Margaret Mitchell, uh, Bobby Jones, the golfer, you name it, folks like that are buried in Oakland. And going on these rounds, I would notice the irises and the dogwoods, things like you see in this picture here. But again, just not computing that this will be my career, but also understanding because he took me in these spaces and looking back, he probably took me in them intentionally, understanding that these spaces were indeed for me and I belong there. When 
I was also growing up, though I grew up in a Black neighborhood, Black family, Black farm, surrounded by all this culture, I went to school on the opposite side of town. And so I went to predominantly white schools. And this is an old school picture. So that's why it's a little blurry. But that is me as a Brownie Scout. And of course, we were involved in outdoor work there. So very early on, I, I think honestly, probably from the age of five forward, I did have to learn how to navigate being Black in predominantly white spaces. And one of the ways that my parents instilled that in me is that they surrounded me with black culture, black history, black art, black dolls. They wanted me to understand who I was and love who I was and also be confident being the only one in the room. And I can't even say it this young that I understood I was the only one, but I understood that I should be there and I belong. And that is honestly all that really mattered. So I mentioned growing up in Atlanta uh, during that time, and this is a place where I grew up at the beginning of the height of Southern hip hop. So even in my work today, you look at these crazy Kool-Aid colors, I think about Outkast and the influence that they had on me. And people may not think about a Southern hip hop group having an influence on your environmental space. But for me, that is very real. Also, um, growing up in Atlanta with the civil rights movement is something that is so present here. The Olympics were going on when I was in high school. We ended up having a delayed graduation because the Olympics were um, uh, started the, the, the year prior uh, to my senior year. And also just being around the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. So it was certain levels of Black empowerment and Black power that I was very conscious of. And I was talking to Katrina before this uh, in the weeks leading to this conversation. And when I was growing up, Atlanta was a very, still at the time, a very black and white town. And now it's definitely much more multicultural. I will say, however, that because there was such a presence of people that looked like me, and this is why I want y'all to understand why representation is so, so important. Yes, I was the only black child in this Brownie Scout troop, but in my mind, white people just existed. They were there. It wasn't an aspirational thing. It wasn't a, uh, it, it, they were just there. It, it was just part of the world that I was in. And I was able to see other people that looked like me leading in these roles in uh, environmental spaces, medical spaces, law, education, whatever it was. And that had a real impact on me and my confidence as I grew and fell into higher roles in the horticulture world. And of course, Stacey Abrams, who is the new queen of Georgia and growing up, there would have been other people, but she certainly had an impact on uh, the state today. So I did not intend to go to college to uh, major in horticulture. This is a true story. I kept changing my major over and over and over. This is Auburn University, it's my alma mater. And this is the, the first building ever built on campus. And I was on the campus bus one day and I saw these students outside, they were holding their clipboards and taking notes and it was a beautiful fall day. And excuse me, I'll grab a real quick sip of water. It was a beautiful fall day. It was a yellow leaf tree. What I now know was a sugar maple. And I was on the bus called the Tiger Transit. And I was thinking, I can't believe that this is a class. They're actually out here getting grades for this. And I had been sitting in business classes with 300 people, no windows, it was an auditorium. So I got off the bus, went in the building, and I found out that those were the horticulture students, and they were in an arboriculture class. They were in a tree class. So essentially, that's all I needed to know. I said, sign me up, count me in. That's what I want to do. And that's how I ended up majoring in horticulture. And when I told my parents, I thought that the initial reaction would be a level of pushback, because here I was changing my major for about the fourth time. But to them, they were with it from the start. They were so into it. And what I didn't understand then is that they saw me as a leader in these spaces. I didn't really know what it would lead to. I just knew I needed to get out of there somehow and find something to do. Now, what I didn't expect when I was at Auburn, this is a picture of me. This is actually my last semester of college. And you can see how unhappy. Actually, by that time, I probably was happy. So I probably took the picture earlier. And this was just a renewed uh, ID. But I really struggled. I struggled at Auburn. And in Atlanta, though I was in these spaces, uh, these predominantly white spaces during the day at school, 
on my weekends, as soon as I go home, as soon as I get on the bus, I was surrounded by people like me. Auburn was the first time I really understood that, oh, the people in this rural area that are white actually have the power as well. Because in Barnesville, my family was equally as power powerful and relevant. So I really, really, really struggled to the point where I failed out of Auburn. I failed out of the horticulture school there. I was on a six month academic suspension, went home. My parents just said, look, here's what you need to do. Just pass. We don't, don't worry about the A, the B, just pass. That's really what matters in life. And when it clicked with me, if I can just pass, and I'm not saying don't get A's. What I'm saying is that sometimes there are various reasons why people aren't succeeding. And for me, it was the culture shock. It was me being the only one in the room in a very different scenario. I went back and was able to finish my degree in horticulture. And again, this is another fuzzy picture. So back in the day, y'all, we used to take pictures on disposable cameras and have to take them up to the CVS or uh, Rite Aid to get them developed. This was me. I'm on the far left, little brown girl there in the middle row on a trip in Wyoming with my horticultural classmates. And we had gone to a ski resort in Wyoming. And then we had gone out to Fort Collins, Colorado for a horticultural competition. So this was how my whole four, five years at Auburn went down just like this. So even though my classmates were friendly, I mean, they were supposed to be, it was very clear to me that horticulture in the South was a good old boys network. And I realized very quickly, I wasn't a good old boy. And I'm gonna see, I just saw someone raise their hand. I'm gonna try to hit the Q and A and I hope I don't, um, mess up the chat. Okay, I will answer that question as soon as I um, finish this slide. And when I saw that it was a good old boys network, I realized things are probably going to be different for me. I didn't know what that would look like. I also realized that my way was probably going to be a little bit harder. I could even see the engagement with the professors. My professors were wonderful professors. They taught me the botanical language I needed to know uh, to sit in interviews confidently. But I didn't have that. It, it was almost like this, this side conversation and relationship that they would have with some of the students certainly didn't have it uh, with me. And that was the real start of me being aware of how my horticulture career might be. Not that it was a bad thing. It was just, it was a thing. It was something to be aware of. And this led me to my first internship. So I'm at, I'm at college. And this was honestly, y'all, my first big break. There was a company called Post Properties. I was a student at Auburn. It was the year 2000. And my very first job actually also came in the year 2000. I was a, a student um, greenhouse assistant at the university greenhouses. So what I did was that I grew and I propagated the interior plants that would go uh, into the president's home or to the graduation or to the various departmental offices. And post properties allowed me this big break. And I'll show you what the break was. I was signed on to be working at apartment complexes, but for whatever reason, when my number came up, they sent me to estate gardens. They sent me to the estates in, of Atlanta of some of the wealthiest people that you can imagine. And by wealthy, I mean people like Arthur Blank that own the Atlanta Falcons, not that they're uh, doing anything with their football team, but I worked at his home. I don't know the man personally, but it helped me understand horticulture at this incredibly high level where money was absolutely no object. And this was me working with uh, Christian Alicio there. You got, you see, I got my printers. We had just done those topiaries behind me. And this was, a lot of my work was also like this. It was myself. I was usually, I, actually, I was always the only black woman that was in labor. And I would be working with Latino men and women the whole way through anytime I had uh, the entry level jobs when I started, which was, it was not a curse. It was actually very much so a blessing, a blessing to be around uh, the, the, the group of people I was with. They taught me so, so much. Now, the second big break. So we're, we've, we fast forwarded, we've left my internship. I graduated from Auburn, y'all. I picked myself up somehow, got that degree, moved out of there and um, ended up, my next job, I left Auburn and became a commercial landscaper with a group called Russell Landscape Group. And that was, I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I thought I was supposed to be a landscaper. And I ended up applying for a job as an arborist with the city of Atlanta Department of Parks. Worked there for two and a half years. And what's important that I need to tell you there, 
that's when I started getting my groove back. It wasn't at the commercial landscape place, though the folks were great to me. I was still the only one. But when I was an arborist for the city of Atlanta, I was one of five black arborists there. There was another gentleman named Brent in the Department of Parks. And then there was Stan, Sean, um, and Victoria who worked in the Bureau of Buildings. And all of them were HBCU graduates, historically black college and university graduates, and they had masters of forestry degrees, something I knew nothing about. I had barely got my first degree and gotten out of there, but it changed my perspective. And I will say that this is very unique to Atlanta because I thought, oh, this is what the black people do in environmental work, they're arborists. And the head of my department, the, the head of design in my department was a gentleman named Frank Fossey, who was a black landscape architect. So that took the restraints off of me that I experienced at Auburn because I finally saw that we do lead in these spaces. I was seeing what my parents saw for me um, ahead of time. And when I left the Arborist Department, I became the landscape manager at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport, which at the time was the world's busiest airport. There was nobody that preceded me in that position. So it was my job to build a horticultural program from scratch. Before it was just a landscape contractor out there. But when I came in, the expectation is that we are going to educate our employees so they will be powered to take care of this land um, on their own without much outside assistance. And this was the type of projects that we worked on. That's myself. You can see Deborah. you'll see a little bit about, uh, about her in uh, later on in the presentation. She's behind me. We were out there felling trees, y'all, pine trees. This is an airport. So certain times trees have to come down um, if they have gotten too close to the airfield, the, the canopy of the branches. So, and what I mean by that is just the extension of the limbs out there. So yes, black women were out there felling trees when we had to, and that's a chainsaw in my hand. And then also we did the cool things like floriculture work, which was my favorite, which is what I had been doing at post uh, landscape uh, properties when I was there. But I just thought it was important to show these pictures because I don't think that people outside of farming, sometimes it's hard to envision what we do in these spaces. And I would just wanna show people that not only do we do it, these pictures are from pretty much 2008, 9, 10. So this is something we're talking about 11, 12 years ago. And there are women that are still doing this type of work. I've moved on, but I just wanted to show you how real it is. Now, I moved on at that airport um, in terms of, I, I, I had initial success. You saw me standing there with my pitchfork, top of the hill, feeling great. I am in aviation horticulture. Even my own professors were now reaching out to me trying to understand how did you get there, Averly? And it was just the surprise of it all because no one, not even them told me that, there, that horticulture in airports was a thing, that it was a thing to be in landscape aviation. And not only did I do it in Atlanta, I was also ended up being the airport landscape manager at Bush Airport, George Bush Airport in Houston, Texas. So I did it twice. So I started to make a name for myself a little bit locally by having these very unique careers. And with success comes a level of expectation. And I started to have imposter syndrome and really deeply struggle at the airport, struggle with my connection with my employees. We started off good, then all of a sudden, things kind of took a turn and I was starting to pressure them and I would say forced concepts on them in a way that I should have never done. And I'll explain how I got out of that. And so I was having a conversation with the gentleman you see here. This is a gentleman named Ryan Ganey. He was a well-known uh, global garden designer, lived in Atlanta, Georgia, originally from South Carolina, and was a friend of mine and a mentor to me. And one day Ryan and I were at his house. It was me, Ryan, and my mama. And I was explaining to them what I just explained to y'all. I've had success, but now the pressure's on and they're bringing more people around and I have to continue to produce. And I don't know that I can do this anymore. I only learned so much at Auburn. And I was sitting in rooms now with landscape architects that were 20 years older than me and senior city planners. And I was feeling it. And, and it was really my age, maybe so than anything with my confidence. And the advice that Ryan and my mother gave to me was that, to know my history, to know my garden history. And when Ryan and my mom were having this conversation with me at his house, at his garden, I thought that they meant go get the Bible and started the hanging gardens at Babylon and move it forward. And then you'll understand garden history. You'll understand Spanish gardens. You'll understand how 
North African gardens influence gardens in France and how they influence uh, the Spanish influence gardens in California. But what was really being said to me was no, my garden history. I, at the time, was a black woman in airports, in ornamental horticulture. What was the path that was laid before me by my people in this same field? And it never, ever, ever occurred to me that people did what I did before I did it. I thought that I must have been the first one at the airport. And my mother had to politely, as mothers do, explain to me, who did I think were doing the estates in Atlanta before I showed up? And she explained to me when I was a child, my uncle Simon was an estate gardener as well. And it just, this light bulb went off. And later that day, she brought me home and she opened up a book. And y'all, if I could find this book today, I would... Uh, cherish it with my life and put it in a safe deposit box, but I, I can't find the book, but I'm determined to find it. Thousands of books in my parents' house, but I want to tell you this story. It's really important. My mother is a retired history educator. She opened up a book that she had tagged. It wasn't a horticulture book. It was just a book, a Black history book, and in that book, it talked about how George Washington Carver was snuck in to Auburn University at night to teach the professors there. And I have never been able to find that on Google or anywhere else, but it was written down one day. And when she said that to me, I just couldn't believe it. And I couldn't believe that I had sat through five and a half years of Auburn horticulture and never heard of this. And the reason it's so shocking is because where Dr. Carver was at Tuskegee, y'all is literally on the same road as Auburn. It's 20 country miles down the road. You take the same uh, wire road, you make a right and you're at Tuskegee. So it was, it was joyful, it was empowering, but it was also a level of rage I felt. I kind of felt like things had been hidden from me and that set me on this path to deeply know my history and it has landed me where I am today. So with that said, it's 1.35. I just wanna take a quick five minute break because we're gonna be here for a while. So take a stretch, whatever you like to do. This is a little commercial break I have for y'all. So for those of you who don't wanna take the five minute break and wanna keep listening, I have a little surprise behind curtain number one here, and I'm going to give you a Black history fact of um, horticulture. So consider this your commercial break, and we will join back, and I'll start my presentation again at 140. And for those that want to hear it, here we go. The first fact is about Colonel Charles Young. Colonel Charles Young. This is the gentleman who was the first Black superintendent of national parks. And he was, his, he was deployed to Sequoia National Park in California. And it was the job of his group, the Buffalo Soldiers, to guard the park. Because at the time, people were poaching. They were cutting down trees. People were just out there in California cutting up, acting a fool, and destroying these parks. So Colonel Charles Young came in. He was deployed there for a summer. And his men in the Buffalo Soldiers unit ended up laying out roads and they did such successful work. They had done more in that summer than people had been able to achieve in years. Now, the thing about Charles Young is that this is a gentleman that graduated from West Point. This is a man that played dozens of instruments and started the uh, marching band at Wilberforce University. And the picture that you see on the right is of his funeral. He was only the fourth military person buried at Arlington National Cemetery. So you can see the level of influence. That ain't one or two folks at no funeral. That's thousands of people that showed up. This was a friend and confidant of W.B. Du Bois. He also had a good relationship uh, or a, a high level of respect for people like Booker T. Washington, uh, who, you know, could butt head with W.E.B. Du Bois sometimes. And he is one of the people that I learned about after I started that journey with my mother showed me with George Washington Carver. So Colonel Charles Young, we salute you on this commercial break and your contributions to a border culture in America. And I'm gonna try to answer this question right quick uh, before the break starts. Excuse me, I, I dropped my clock. It says, how do, we how do we cultivate a sense of stewardship, responsibility in communities whose residents perceive themselves as being marginalized? When people, I, I can't speak for other people's journey, but the pictures I so showed you, when I saw myself as other and marginalized and outside of that good old boys network, I felt distant and I felt far away. And I knew I would never be able to permeate that club. To this day, I'll never be a good old boy in the South. We, we, we share Southern heritage, 
we share degrees from Auburn and I still can't necessarily get into the rooms they want to get in or are in. And I don't see that as a bad thing because I get to show up and be myself and be free and not have to assimilate. And I think that that is what we should really encourage people who are marginalized. Don't try to assimilate, just show up, be yourself, know who you are, know your heritage, know your strengths, maybe even know that this is your legacy. So in my instance, I think about how black people were brought here in bondage across the middle passage because they were exceptional. And I mean, exceptional agrarians, exceptional cultivators of the soil, exceptional fishermen. They were exceptional with the land. So when I think about that, and I am the only one in the room, at one point I was the youngest in the room. I'm certainly not that anymore. Uh, I may be the only black woman at a meeting. I believe I'm supposed to be at those tables and I don't have that level of imposter syndrome at all anymore ever. If anything, I'm wondering, are there imposters at the table around me? And so I think that you just have to tap into a level of confidence in yourself and belief and faith and know that you can do it. You were chosen to do it. There's a reason why you're there and pull through. And I'm saying this to answer your question. You have to pat yourself on the back sometimes. I was my own cheerleader for a long time. And that is okay if that's what you have to be. I'm not saying it's the ideal situation, but sometimes that's what it takes. So I hope that may have answered your question a little bit. And if not, we will discuss it a little more in the chat. I see another question and I'll answer this one in the final minute. I'll get started in one minute. It says, how do we revive the art of tree box beautification in our neighborhood once again? And it's as simple as it ain't nothing to it, but to do it. So what do I mean by that? I look to people because I, in my work, I celebrate the history and the art of horticulture. I look to people like the Negro Women's Clubs of Virginia that started in 1932 with no support. And within 10 years, they had set up a legacy where there were thousands of black garden clubs, mostly women led throughout the Southern states. And they didn't have, these women were hidden in plain sight, hidden in plain sight, doing what they did, giving each other awards, giving each other seminars, working with people from places like Hampton University, North Carolina a and Tuskegee, all these places you name. So sometimes, you got to get out there and just be the one to start it. How can we start to get garden clubs back? Honestly, you, you just start. It, it, it's, it, I know that sounds so simplistic, but it's where one or two are gathered. And when the Black Garden Clubs gathered and started in Virginia, there were four people in the room that day. And there was one woman, a woman named Ethel Early Clark. PJ Chesson, an educator, was there. And also Asa Sims, who was the state advisor for the garden club and a professor from Hampton named Dr. Uh, William Cooper. I did a lecture on this. I can give a link to Katrina afterwards, y'all can see. But those four people started something that turned into thousands of clubs throughout the, the nation. So it's a lot of work to do it on your own. I would suggest getting two more people to start it with you and go from there. Okay, so commercial break is over, y'all. We'll get back into the presentation. Back to the conversation with my mama and Ryan Ganey about understanding my garden history. This is a picture of my great-great-grandmother. Her name is Viney Few. And she was born into slavery. She was 12 years old when the uh, soldiers came to where she was. She was milking a cow is the way the story was told in my family or the way she told the story to my family. So let me just put a little pin right here to be very clear. Much of Black history is oral history, and we have to accept that that is a valid form of history. It doesn't have to be that somebody was standing there to inscribe her words. The fact that this is the story she told her children, this is what it was. So this is how my grandmother, a great-great-grandmother, found out that slavery had ended, and the, the Union soldiers came up and told her that um, we have won the Civil War. And she is in a very important link in my life um, because she ended up leaving the Purifor plantation where she was um, enslaved at the time. And then our family moved on many years later into Barnesville, Georgia. Now, this is her one of her sons. This is my great grandfather. His name is Shafu. And this is the man that who 
started my family's farm in Barnesville, Georgia, and he essentially started it from scratch, from nothing. And this is super important because I think about how my parents had the money and the privilege and the access to send me to Auburn, where I earned my horticulture degree, no doubt, and they had the financial means to pay for it. But when the stories are told and people ask, well, who's the horticulturist in the room? It's usually somebody like me that gets the credit. And when I say somebody like me, I mean someone that had the financial means and the privilege to have the degree in it. And I know in a hundred lifetimes, I could never out horticulture my great, great granddaddy, that, my great grandfather rather, it's impossible. So if you wanna know who the real horticulturist is, the real agrarian, the real exceptional cultivators of the soil, it is shock you, the gentleman you see in front of me. And this is my grandmother, Beatrice Few, and we call her Brown, Brownie was her nickname, Brownie Few. Now this is really, really important because Shy Few, the man that you see in the middle of the screen raised my mother. My mother was raised by her grandfather, and her grandmother. My mother is in the room right behind me right now, taking a nap, enjoying her Saturday with her two little dogs. So my point to you is this, the man that raised my grandmother, his mother was born into slavery and we act like this was a thousand years ago and it wasn't. And it still blows my mind to this day that my mom says, yeah, his mom was enslaved at one point. So the fact that my mom is still alive, the fact that she's still here to tell me stories that her grandfather shared with her, that just shows you how real and how close we are to uh, what it was like to be in these spaces, put this work in the land for free and get nothing in return. But I was fortunate that my family was able to get something in return by their land. We still own the land, though no one is there. The elders have left the farm. The land is still in our family. Praise God. So I wanna show you moving on uh, my great, my grandmother and why she's so important to my horticultural legacy. So these are pictures. These are real pictures of my grandmother's quilts. There's actually two quilts right here. You can probably see the line in the middle of the screen. And when I was dealing with some imposter syndrome and telling this to Ryan and telling it to my mama, I was saying, but these landscape architects, they're creatives and they're artisans. And so my mother, had to remind me, Abra, let me show you something. Opened up a treasure, or I call it a treasure chest, but it was a chest. There were 20 beautifully stacked quilts in there that my grandmother and, and great aunts had made. They were artisans too. And it clicked with me, oh my gosh, I am from a family of artisans. I don't just have to look at other people and think that they're better than me and, and know that I came from this. And what's so important is that you can see these scraps are cut by hand. You can see that there wasn't some map in AutoCAD to show them how to design. They just did it and they did it from their heart and they did it by having what we would call a designer's eye. So this is what was later fueled and injected into my work to teach other people. This is Shafu and then this is also uh, his wife, which was my grandpa, grandmother. Um, my great grandmother is who this is with him. And these are the two people that raised my mama. Now, what I wanted to bring up to you about my grandfather and how he was so successful with his family farm is that look at his Georgia driver's license here, y'all, and look at the bottom, the signature. It says his X mark. So what does that tell you? My great-grandfather was illiterate. That means that he couldn't read and write. That did not make him any less of a successful farmer and businessman. And I say this because there is more than one way, as they say, more than one way to skin a cat. And they're not talking about a kitty cat, we're talking about more than one way to skin a catfish, right? You can scale it, you can pull the, the, the skin off of it, you can chop it up, whatever you wanna do. So it showed me that the book way that I was learning at Auburn wasn't the only way to be successful in agriculture because before then I deeply believed that that was the way. Now, this is my Aunt Nell, this is my grandmother's sister. and What's also important is that when I got to Auburn and started learning things, I was really feeling myself. And this plant that you see in front of you, y'all, it's an amaryllis. Many of y'all know that. I was at 20, probably 19, 20 before I knew this was an amaryllis. And before then, I just thought the plant was called Ain't Nell because that's what my family called the plant because, oh, Ain't Nell and her amaryllis is our, we pulled this out of Aunt Nell's yard. It was Aunt Nell, Aunt Nell, Aunt Nell. And Aunt Nell was a seamstress in real life, an exquisite seamstress, I must say. And 
it was one of those times that I would come home and say, mama, that plant isn't called ain't male. It's called an amaryllis. And again, I'm telling my mother and my great aunts these things like they didn't already know it was an amaryllis. But their idea was to me or their comment to me was, baby, you ain't learned nothing at that school. They thought the audacity of me to come back to my family's farm and let them know how they had been misnomering. That's the word that we had used at Auburn, mis no, no, uh, no misnaming the names of these plants. So it's the reality check of checking yourself and not forgetting who you are as you progress in these environmental spaces. Just because they taught it to you in school does not make the way that the elders taught you invalid by any means. Now, these are pictures um, of, I want y'all to see Aunt Lois. And this was the last uh, legacy that lived on my farm. This is my grandmother's other sister, one of her other sisters. There were a few sisters there. And Aunt Lois is the one who, when we would go on the weekends and I wouldn't spend my weekends in the parks of my dad, it was her farm. So it had been passed on to her from my great grandfather. And she's sitting there and that plastic sheet behind you, that's her greenhouse. So again, places of no waste on these uh, rural farms. She took those plastic sheets from some delivery she had gotten one day and turned that into a greenhouse on our porch. What I also want you to notice on the left is that that rug right there, that was a day after it had rained. And Aunt Lois was the type that would get out there and sweep her yard. She would sweep this path right up to the front door where the chickens would come and step in it and do their little scratching during the day in the morning and kept that swept yard swept. So she was certainly someone where the vernacular landscape was ingrained in her. And you see the array of her flowers. She always kept a potted garden there's a little history behind that. If we look at African-Americans, the way the land has been taken from them, it is easy to always take your garden with you. So sometimes you'll notice a lot of containers in black gardens. And sometimes we've lost this folklore. We don't even understand why we have it that way. But that was one of the reasons that anthropologists and scientists understand it made your garden mobile. So they may can take the land from you, but they can never take the garden from you. So I always loved that she had these containers on display no matter what. This is me and my mama, the one I told you is in the other room. And um, not only did I decide I wanted to announce at the family farm that, by the way, y'all, this is called an amaryllis, like they really didn't know that. We had also gone to visit um, a, a few years later, one of our family friends, some successful farmers in Montezuma, Georgia, and they're black farmers, own hundreds of acres to this day, uh, do cotton, peanut, um, uh, sweet potatoes, they do it all. And those farmers in Mont Montezuma, the, the Hires family, uh, Robert Hires is his name, gave my mama some peanuts. And I thought that was such a nice gesture. And when we got in the car, I said, oh, mama, that's so sweet. Robert gave you those peanuts, but we don't have land to grow peanuts. My parents lived in a two acre wooded home in Atlanta, Georgia. So two beautiful wooded acres in Southwest Atlanta. And I said, well, we can't grow peanuts. We don't have what they have, they have land and sunlight. So my mama said, well, yeah, she didn't say no, I couldn't do it. She just kind of left it there. Well, I wanna show y'all a picture. And this, the picture on the right, those are the peanuts that Robert Hires had given my mama. And you can look closely and you see the little goobers right at the end. And what she showed me was later on that summer, she said, Abe, remember when you told me I couldn't grow those peanuts? I said, yeah, I hadn't even thought about the peanuts. And we were sitting there, at her house eating some roasted peanuts. And she said, those peanuts that I gave you are, that are basically in your hands right now are the ones that I got from Robert Heyer. So don't ever tell me what I can't grow. And she, again, reminded me, she was the one that grew up on the farm. So I was out there in brownie scouts and Buckhead. So again, just this idea of when a, uh, somebody brought up the point of a marginalized community, you really can do it. She put those peanuts in a raised container. She knew which way to work the soil. And even though that was only a pot that was about 20 inches wide or whatever it was, she was able to grow a peanut crop. So it is always possible. And that was a lesson for me that really it is nothing I can't do out here because I knew that somebody before me had always done it, including growing peanuts in a pot. So it just gave me a very, very high level of confidence to go forward with. And it helped me to understand my family's history and to lean back in those roots and be proud and don't just tell somebody, oh, thanks, but no thanks, I can't do that. You can always try. And that was the lesson for my mom, just always try when you're in these spaces. Even if you fail, you always try. 
another lesson for me on that journey to understand my history, clearly I knew I was from a black family. I told you I grew up around black art in Atlanta where this is a city that was burned to the ground during the civil war. And it was the formerly enslaved black people who rebuilt the city. And that's why you see Morehouse here today, Spelman, the Atlanta University Center. And to this day, about a 52% um, black population within the city. So our people built this city up from the ashes uh, when it was burned to the ground. And one of the things that really um, clicked with me was all of the contributions we had made. So the lady that you see in the top left, this is Afropunk look, just what black women do with their hair, how it is an art form. People like Dapper Dan, where his street style was once shunned. And now Gucci has how them tables turn and they had to reach out to him to understand what was hot in the market and to get his name and work with Dapper Dan to do a co collaboration once they had previously shamed him in the 80s. People like Bisa Butler, whose artwork I adore, who uses quilting as her medium and helped me to understand how to use quilting in my own um, practice. And, and the way that I would use that quilt, you'll see a little bit later, just in terms of black art and the artisanship. Food like gumbo, just the legacy of the black cultural heritage, how the diaspora with people from the Caribbean, people, Brazil, wherever you wanna name it, how we were able to take parts of the food that people didn't even necessarily even want and make these dishes that are just incredible, incredible. My mama grew up, uh, she would always make gumbo for us, especially at Christmas. And then the music, the, the music of hip hop. And I told you I grew up around the height of hip hop in the South and it's still popping off if we're being honest, it's just evolved with the younger group. So just growing up around a lot of black excellence and infusing that into the success of my horticulture career. Because when I was at Auburn, I was thinking, how am I gonna do this? I'm not a good old boy. And then I realized I don't have to. There's a lot of black excellence that lives within me and I need to keep this same energy, but stick it into the airport, into my work there. And that launched me to this point. So these were two of my uh, employees at the airport. This was Jason Joe on the left and Deborah Hughes on the right. And Deborah has since retired. Um, and specifically with Jason, I was really struggling to connect with him. My crew at the Atlanta airport was five black women. Jason was the, uh, the only black man. And then I had some Latino men and uh, some Latino contractors working for me, which also had women in there as well. And I really struggled to connect with Jason. And I thought that it was because I'm a woman, I'm his boss. He didn't really want to listen to me, but it turned out that that's what it, it, it really wasn't that at all. What it was is that I came in and I said, oh, okay, well, we have this airport staff. I know what to do. I went to Auburn. So this starts with soil science. Then you go to perennial plants. Then you go to small trees and woody shrubs. So I had laid out this curriculum that I wanted the staff to learn. And this is a mix of my staff, which did the exterior landscape and also the people that did the airfield. So airport landscape management, just so you understand how it works. You do the perimeter, which is front facing, the things that you see um, with the decorative side, and then there's the airfield work. And some of those people work the airfields, which is turf grass management. That's simply what it is. And so I set up these classes and brought in a gentleman named Dr. Richard Ludwig from Gwinnett Tech to teach them. And you can see front row, it's some folks deeply engaged, taking notes, learning, getting their horticultural education on. And I thought, oh, I know I got to be doing it right. This is the way I was taught at Auburn. This must be the, the way. But with Jason, you can see the look on his face. And this is a plant quiz. And I used to feel that same way sometimes and didn't like to have to write back the botanical Latin and all that other stuff. He just wasn't feeling it. He wasn't happy with me. He thought that I'm always... He always said, plant, he called me plant lady. You're always forcing these plants on us and just trying to do it your way. And I just, he just didn't like the way that I was interacting with him. And I just thought he was being a problem on my team. So we butted heads and I finally said, Jason, what do you want? What do you like? What would you prefer to be doing? If you could do any job in the world, do you want to do? And he said, I'm a baseball player. I grew up playing baseball. I was on a award winning team. Uh, I guess a state team growing up with his group. And that's what I like to do. And that's what I'm teaching my son, how to play baseball. And I said, oh, oh, really? I see. I realized I had been doing it wrong with Jason the, long, the whole way. 
And here's why. So now Jason got a little smile on his face. We didn't got along at this point. We have moved on. I have heard him out. He really wants to be playing baseball. He doesn't want to deal with these plants. And what it I, occurred to me when I went home and I had a talk with myself, I had a talk with my mom, is that I mentioned to y'all, I showed y'all my granddaddy's license where he was illiterate. He didn't read and write. So what does that mean? How did he run the successful farm? This man could read the signs and signals of the landscape and the land. He could read the plants. He didn't have to read the words in the book. He didn't have to do any of that, but he could read what was going on in nature. And it occurred to me that that's what baseball players do. Those folks behind home plate doing all these little symbols and you know all that to tell them which pitch to throw. That's what Jason, he didn't want to see it in botanical Latin. He didn't want to see the Linnaeus system. He didn't want to sit up there and take written plant quizzes. I said, I need to probably start showing him the signs and the signals of the environment and that might work. And it worked. And this was the way that I was able to connect with Jason by listening to him and understanding the way he wanted to learn about the environment versus the way that I was taught the playbook by a university and started showing him the signs and signals. And so he started realizing, oh, the plants will tell you something. So this is a, a piece of an azalea that he had cut out of a plant. And he realized, wow, the rest of the plant is green. It looks healthy. It's got a lot of foliage. But this one little piece here is scraggly. Something must be going on. So he started really becoming this eagle eye to see things in the landscape, I would even say, before people would start noticing them. And that was one way to connect. And then also, uh, I showed you that we felled trees. He really started kind of feeling himself, y'all. And he was one that would really get out there and show people, hey, this is how you can count the rings on the tree. This is what this hollow piece means. This is what Ganoderma is, this mushroom type thing that you see growing into this plant. So showing people another way and saying, look, forget what the book says, just go with the signs and the symbols. And this is what I did. And this is how I was able to connect with Jason. And believe it or not, y'all, we are still in touch to this day. Um, we talk maybe about twice a year, but we do still indeed talk. Now I'm going to take, it is right at two o'clock. I'm going to take another quick little five minute break. I'll give y'all a fun fact. And if you want to get up and take a stretch, get some water, whatever, please feel free to do so. And we will reconvene at 205. I'm going to get a quick sip of water. And even, I don't know who behind is, who is behind this paper bag, but we're going to see. And I'll give you a fun black history fact. And before I do that, um, I believe the name is Cinta Keeling. I hope I said your name right. Said, how does your family use your land, timber cover crop? Have you thought of forest on it? Cinta, the honest to God truth is that the family land belongs to the grandkids of my great grandfather. So you got 10 different people with 10 different ideas of how to work that land and what to do with it. So I'm saying that to say absolutely nothing is happening on that land. It is something that I have had to uh, come to accept because the grandchildren are still alive. I'm the great grandchild at this point. So there are people before me and, and so many shares of acres goes to whoever your parent was. So again, my mother's mom had four children that's divided four ways, the, the amount of land that she has. And it is something where the house that I showed you that it's completely overgrown. It's a dilapidated house now. The land is still there. We pay the taxes every year, but it's one of those stories that um, I don't have a good, happy ending to it. And I've accepted that Barnesville lives in my heart now. And what I grow up seeing or what I grew up seeing through my 30s, it's not going to exist anymore. And if I want to recreate that, I'm just going to have to have my own land. But my family still owns it, but it's just overgrown now. The, past, the cow pasture is overgrown. The house is still there and it's almost like this buried relic of history because there were still even items in that house. So very sad story. But surprise, surprise. Now, who do we see? And some of y'all probably recognize this picture is actually right behind me in pop color, my pop art pink. These are, this is a image from Harper's Weekly in 1870. And I've showed Charles Young, Colonel Charles Young before because he was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. These are the flower sellers at the market in Washington, DC. And I showed them because you can see there's a pattern here. I'm trying to show DMV folks on these commercial breaks today. So thank goodness that some artists for the paper 
had the foresight to capture these women and to draw them in detail. You got to remember, this is five years after the Emancipation Proclamation has been read. And even before then, there were people in the DMV area that had their own land. So these were Black women that brought their flowers in through horse and carriage into the uh, streets of DC in front of the Potomac River to sell these plants. And look deeply at the picture. You can see potted plants. You can see cut flowers. You can see the gay lays on their head. And when you also go to Google, and I've written about this on my Instagram, when you type in flower farmers, you rarely see women that look like this, meaning women of color, black women, brown women. So to be very clear, the original flower farmers look just like me. And these were women, they were business women. You can even see the community in this picture and how beautiful it looks. You can see how they are interacting with each other. And it is said that spring didn't arrive until these women arrived with their flowers in June to the flower market. So I hope that that was an informational commercial break for you. And we got about one more minute and then we will get started. Okay, it's 2.05 and I will move on forward. So moving on, you saw Jason, you heard my story about Jason. Now this is Deborah Hughes and Deborah, um, I showed you the black culture and the lady with the Afro punk hair and all those cool things, Missy Elliott and uh, super duper fly, Missy Elliott. And we know how many wonderful, fabulous style and fashion changes she has had. Deborah Hughes is someone who came to our interviews. She came in three times to interview for the job and pretty much everyone at the table did not want to hire her. And I said, no, we, I wanna hire her. Now, Deborah did have previous horticulture experience. She worked at the Atlanta um, greenhouse. So the, the parks department, they grow their own plants uh, that go in the park. So the flowers, violas, things like that, they grow them in the greenhouse. So I had met her in passing there, but, the people at the airport were still looking at the job description. It says lift 50 pounds, must be able to handle a John Deere tractor that's two tons, yada, yada, yada. Just these like ridiculous, ridiculous statements on the job description. And they looked at Deborah Hughes and said, I don't think she can really handle this. And I looked at her and I said, well, you've charged me here to create a horticulture program, a beautification program from scratch. Key word in their beauty Deborah's a person I want to hire. So why do I want to hire Deborah? Well, y'all, I got three pictures of Deborah, and you can see there are three different hairstyles in each picture. This is how she showed up to every interview. Different hair each time, different nails each time, different jewelry each time. And I said, this is the woman I want to hire to work with for beautification. Why? Because I knew that she understood style, aesthetics. I knew that she understood trends and change. And I knew that if she could do ombre hair and she could do statement nails and nail design, she could put that same energy into the ground and do what I needed to do. And I deeply believe that. And I remember telling my bosses that and they just kind of did not seem convinced, but it didn't matter. I believed in Deborah, and that was honestly one of the best decisions I ever made. And Deborah's work ended up changing my life. And she is the reason I was able to go on to Houston, Texas and run the airport landscape there. But here's the thing, I put it on Deborah like I put it on Jason. Well, Deborah, if we're gonna do these flower beds, this is what you do. You pull out your graph paper because at the time we were still doing hand drawing. We didn't have the money to do AutoCAD um, uh, at the airport. We had the money, but they weren't gonna give it to me to buy an AutoCAD uh, program. And I showed her, you lay it out, you do the measurements, you come up with your plant list, you go by the book. And she did it. She actually didn't give me pushback. And you can see her hair is different. This. It, so this is five hairstyles in like 60 seconds, y'all. This was Deborah. This is why I wanted her in my beautification program. Now, and you even see her pictures laid out. She is diligently coming up with these plans. And I said, well, Deborah, I want to do the final approval here. And whatever you do, I'll look at it. We'll make the changes. It'll go in the ground. 
no problem. She said, fine, let's do it. I like this. This is, this is my jam. That was her jam. And so this is what she ended up coming up with. It, it's not bad at all. You see the wave petunias in the front. You see zinnia, uh, lantana is probably the yellow, purple heart on the edges. So this really bold black color and you can see it from the sky. So that's the other thing. I know y'all say this is really over the top and airport landscape, those planes land. So you do want the type of seasonal color that people can see from above, see from, from higher heights. And I thought it was pretty and I thought it was effective. And I thought, what if I'm doing her the way I'm doing Jason? What if I just let her do her thing without being a micromanager? Because I didn't want it done to me, but I realized that that is how I was doing Deborah. And it occurred to me again, about my grandmother and her quilts. What if I just let Deborah, the, the queen of the flowers at the airport, um, and there was also a group called Simply Flowers, uh, Jenny Hargrave that worked with us. So shout out to Jenny, a woman business owner. But what if I did Deborah, let, let Deborah, who worked on my crew, do the flowers her way? And I wasn't just saying, let me see your designs. Let me approve them. Let me correct them for you. Because now the power has shifted. I've been to Auburn and now I'm feeling myself because of my Barnesville background. And I wanted to micromanage and correct her. What if I just let you do it the way you would do it? Meaning the way my grandmother would do it, which is designer's eye. Let me take what I think should go in the ground together, lay those things out and see what happens. And so I said, Deborah, this next summer, this next warm season installation, that's what we called it, the warm season, because it could have been in the spring. You do the plants the way you would do them. I'm not going to check your designs. Just do them how you do them and we'll see how it's going to come out. And I got to tell you, I was nervous. I Knew though that my uh, fallback would be, we could just pop by the plants and redo it. It was an airport, they had money, which isn't a good fallback plan and it's not a fiscally responsible one, but it was a risk I was willing to take because I just wanted to see. I wanted to see what would happen if I just released her to do her own thing. And this is what happened. This is Deborah's bed without me being putting my business into her bed and I'm going to go backwards so you can see her bed when I told her this is the way it should look now look at that quilt and look at this bed that bed it looks like these flowers were quilted into the ground it is stunning she used nipphophia she used I think those are Aaron caladiums she used zinnia I would have never put that plumbago in there like that the, the light blue in the background but she did and this bed ended up winning her an award and again when you let people do what they want to do, not what they want to do let them do their own thing the way that they would do it she had the style I told I told my bosses look at her hair look at her nails this is amazing but yet I came in the most stylish person on my team I came in and told her I can do this flower style better than you though and I was wrong and let me show you just a container she did just something casual um which is pretty amazing a picture's a little blurry, but the point is here. So we needed some containers that would, there was some big wig coming into the airport and they needed some containers at this airport office pretty much within four hours. We had four hours to get this in because they needed to be in by the morning. So Deborah put this together. These, you would think these plants had sat there for three months growing. This was all Home Depot. This was a Home Depot run on the right, y'all, an emergency Home Depot run. So this is what happens when we get out of people's way and let them do what they do naturally, which is in this case, I was telling a black woman who understood black culture, how she was gonna do her style in the garden and I was wrong. So we have to get out of each other's way as well. And this is what I wanted y'all to see. It's not about AutoCAD. It's not always about putting it on paper. It's about letting people do what they know how to do and work with their own hands and work with it organically and intuitively. Now, you see me in the middle, these people on the right, of me, I think that's, I'm left-handed. I always get the directions confused, but that way, the white lady and the black man, they are visiting, they are on a tour to tour this floral clock that this team in front of you built. So that's Marsha, Omni, and Deborah, my ace boon coon right there in the middle, installed the flowers in this floral clock at Atlanta's airport. It's no longer standing today, it stood for 10 years. And this was a 17 foot LED light clock. We worked with a company out of St. Louis and Deborah, was such a big lead on this project. And there are a few pictures here you can see of her actually doing the installation. So um, this is what happens. And when people say, well, 
how do we get people to do this? Or there's a history or a legacy of women of color not doing this work. That's not true. Just like the Virginia Garden Clubs, we've been doing it and we've been hidden in plain sight doing this work. So we do it. We ain't new to, tr what do they say? We ain't new to this. We true to this, how the saying goes. We are so true to this level of work. To the point, Deborah's retired now, as I mentioned earlier, but this was her legacy. It's been torn down now. I accept that landscapes are ephemeral. Sometimes I wonder if Atlanta had been conscious that black women built this, had, been, had it been protected, would it have been protected as a historic landscape? Maybe, maybe not, but that's just the way the landscape game goes. So yes, we once built a floral clock too, y'all. Thank God I had a pictures to prove it because this was before the Instagram era. And I actually, that is a, a quick little commercial break, but I'm gonna answer this question and, and I'll just keep going so we don't have to uh, take this commercial break so soon after the last one. Unless you want to, please feel free, go right ahead. I'm gonna answer this question from Sylvia. And if you wanna stretch, go ahead. And then we'll get into the final stages and right about 2.30, maybe a little sooner, we will start taking questions. I got one little quick segment after this one. I'm gonna answer your question, Sylvia. I'll show the commercial and I'm gonna keep it rolling. So we may even finish early today. It says, how can we manage, maintain community interest in participating in gardens? Any innovative strategies? We are inviting houseless members to join and heal with us. So I think that we have to go back to personal relationships. And the question was, are there any innovative strategies? And what I have found with my background working in airports, doing public horticulture, um, the connection, the one-on-one -on -one time I spent with Jason and the one-on-one -on -one time I spent with Deborah, and even many cases taking them to my meetings with these landscape architects, having them in the room, that was more impactful in, in not only making them interested, keeping their level of interest up. So what do I mean by that? Even when I was in a landscape manager at Bush Airport in Houston, Texas, my staff was Cambodian and Latino American and black. And I say this to say, I didn't have any friends when I moved to Houston, none. And I found myself being the leader, but yet nobody to sit with at lunch. And it was very awkward because you're in this role, you got a title and you go into the break room and you're like, wow, this is what it feels like in high school all over again. And so what I started doing, I ate lunch with my team. I could have ate in my office with my window and my air. And I went outside at the picnic benches where they ate. Number one, their food was amazing. Cambodian food in Texas, Texas barbecue, Tex-Mex, that's what they were bringing. And that one-on-one -on -one time at lunch, that 30 minutes spending that with them had me a level of engagement. I couldn't have got it from bringing in a professor. I couldn't have brought it in from um, hiring someone. I couldn't have YouTubed them and showed them a video. I think it's for real one-on-one -on -one contact and it, and it takes time. So it takes a real time and investment, but it doesn't take forever. And then when you're in those spaces and spending one-on-one -on -one time with people, you get invited. So the Cambodians would say, hey, why don't you come to mass with me? Why don't you come to our Cambodian New Year celebration? And I would do it. And that three month of investment time led to just so many greater things and led to my job being easier. So we gotta, I think the innovative strategy I'm trying to tell you is to spend time with people. And I realize the pandemic has not allowed that. But now that we're in a place where that may be possible much sooner than later, I think we have to go back to, to that, to, to one by one and, and honestly planting that seed and watering it and nurturing it and rooting it and letting it be organic. Because as I told you, I'm still in touch with Deborah. I'm still in touch with Jason. I still talk to my Cambodian friends in Houston that were in the landscape industry with me because we had a personal relationship. And I didn't make it too, too friendly. I was still their colleague, but they saw one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with me in leadership and I didn't just leave them as the laborer to do the work because I know what that feels like as well. And that's not how you want anyone to feel, especially when they're doing an environmental type job. You wanna be present. So I'm gonna go over our last commercial break. Ooh, la la, this, surprise, surprise. This is Mr. Thomas Queen, y'all, of Annapolis, Maryland. Thomas Queen is our commercial break star. Thomas Queen, this is a picture of him in 1920. And at the time he's around 86 years old. And this is in his greenhouse because Mr. Thomas Queen was getting it on y'all. He was selling his plants throughout Baltimore 
in Annapolis. So, yep, there are plants in the DMV that Thomas Green propagated. Well, how did he get there? Well, Thomas Queen was born into slavery. And he one day was outside and saw some geraniums in an ash can where the ashes are from a fire. And he pulled those geraniums out. He propagated it, rooted them. And that was the start of him selling these plants. He also at one time was a a uh, gardener at the state at the, the the state house which is the governor's mansion so again this legacy and the fact that he's almost 86 in this grainy little picture is just amazing that thomas green went on to build this legacy of a greenhouse these plants so he started from scratch he didn't have much but just proof that it don't take much to do it you just got to start so propagate one by one and you too can end up with a greenhouse business like mr thomas queen okay so we're gonna move on so I can get through this last part at 10 minutes, we'll hit it by 2.30 and start our discussion. I will tell y'all this, back in 2000, when I was running around Auburn watering plants, most of the black people at this school were there for athletics, so probably playing football or some really cool sport or engineering. Um, they really thought something was wrong with me. They couldn't believe I was in horticulture. They were like, what are you doing, Averly? I didn't even know what I was doing. I just knew that I felt way cooler taking classes outside with my clipboard, even if I had to put on a scarf, even if it was raining, I had my umbrella. I knew I was outside and 90% of my classes were outside. And that is a true story. And as, even though I thought it was cool in my brain, no one around me thought it was cool. And they thought I had just signed my life away to be a landscaper. And there is nothing wrong with being a landscaper. Let me be clear, I've been one. However, the shift occurred and I feel like I bore witness and many of you did too. When Mrs. Obama, forever first lady in my book, started her White House garden, because all of a sudden around 2008, 2009, and I'm at the parties with my friends and they say, well, what do you do? I'm a horticulturist. Then it was like, skirt, you're a horticulturist. Well, let me talk to you. That's when I became the cool kid on the block. So I credit her with shifting the culture and getting this reignited interest in environmental careers because before the end, I can tell you nobody at the party was trying to get me an extra drink, y'all. They were just, oh, she's a horticulturist. Uh, let's go talk to the lawyer over there. So thank you, Mrs. Obama, for bringing this to the forefront and showing people what they can do with the lands. And even though her lane was food, I hope that you've seen today how expansive horticulture really is when we're in these spaces. Who knew? Even my own parents didn't even know to tell me about airports. So just wanted to mention that. Another thing that I learned working with Jason, Deborah, Omni, Marsha, Crew 38, that was the name of the team um, in Atlanta, the airport Crew 38, was they showed me that, look, everybody don't want to hear it from the book. And we had to talk about insects. Now, this is a newer picture, but I just wanted to use you as a, to show an example to you. Butterflies, the Lepidoptera family. If you just write Lepidoptera family on the board, that's so boring. But if you can show a butterfly in a fly way, like literally her hairstyle is fly then you talking and i was able to talk about si siphoning mouth parts how butterflies their tongue unfolds it's this straw uh, like a bendy straw and it coils back up in the way butterflies pollinate but you don't always just have to do that in such a technical way you can do it in a way that it resonates with your audience so be creative be open use style use culture use whatever you got to use to get people engaged uh with your horticulture program and i want to say this janelle cooper who is the tech woman of the day today, thank you so much for making all this possible. Talked about when we were going over these slides earlier for y'all got on how butterflies are about, when you see a group of them together, the transformation there, um, how it is a renewal in life and spirit. And I'm saying it's so bad. She said it so eloquently. So I'm gonna put her on the spot when it's my turn to get off and it's a group discussion so she can explain that to y'all, but what butterflies mean to people in terms of a Renaissance. So just think, of the myriad of ways that you can teach entomology, entomological art to your audience. It doesn't just always have to be what you see in the book. And Beyonce, now it, there is no horticulture uh, presentation I'm gonna do without saying her name or showing her face because she really is the one to me. I am a Beyonce stan and I own it. However, they didn't pay me to talk about Beyonce, but people do talk, pay me to talk about hydrangea macrophylla, the mop head hydrangea. And no one wants to go talking about how to spell macrophylla, but if you put Beyonce in the front, and in this case, she's put herself in the front, 
it is so much easier to have this conversation, talk about shade, talk about texture, look how the fine, the little leaf looks like an arborvita is behind it. And then you've got the big leaf, the coarse texture, the macrophylla in front, the sun catchers, the bigger leaf plants, the shade. You see how I just gave y'all a whole shade horticulture design, less than fine coarse texture right there with Queen Beyonce. So this is another way that you, and it doesn't have to be this way. This is a way that has worked for me. I'm not saying it's gonna work for you. I'm saying figure out the way that will work for you. So when you, somebody mentioned an innovative strategy, not that this is original, but I mean, it was innovative to me because it was, a, my teachers didn't teach it to me this way, but I found myself teaching it this way to my people. So maybe that's an innovative strategy for you. And finally, I wanna talk about the Longwood Gardens Fellowship. So started in Barnesville, y'all, coming up in Atlanta, went to Auburn, failed out, came back and made it, landscaper, arborist, airport landscape manager. I also worked at UGA Extension. I didn't mention that today. And the previous job I had before I started my own company was at Longwood Gardens as a Longwood Fellow. And I wanna show you these pictures. This is me at Chateau Villandry in France. This was last uh, January, February, and a part of March before the pandemic hit and I had to come home. And I cannot complain because it is wonderful to be in France on someone else's dime. And my French is so bad, y'all. I didn't know I was going to show up to work and see a castle. I showed up my first day, blew my mind. It was It is considered the world's most beautiful vegetable garden. And it truly, truly is that. So I want y'all to see that I made it all the way from Barnesville to Chateau Villandry in the Loire Valley of France because of my environmental career. And I had a eight week rotation here where I did some historical research for the Chateau. I also, y'all saw my commercial breaks. This was a lecture I gave back in Black History Month of 2020. I do these all the time. I'll be doing one in California in a few weeks. And this one was specifically titled Lift Every Voice, of course, inspired by the James Weldon Johnson song to Lift Every Voice. And it was a celebration of African-Americans and horticulture. So the folks you saw in their commercial break, that's the type of people I talk about. And shameless plug, I'm also working on the manuscript so you can hear more of their story in detail and not on a commercial break. And then finally, this was um, me back out there in the field, Chateau Villandry. I have moved on up like the Jeffersons, y'all. So unfortunately, what happens in environmental career, that means that you're doing more office work, more paperwork. Now I'm back into the room that I didn't want to be in in the first place. So it was a joy to actually get outside and get my hands back in the dirt. And that's what I was able to do while working at the Chateau, left the Longwood Gardens Fellowship and was able to officially launch Conquer the Soil where knowledge is our currency. And I am paid to work with cultural institutions to celebrate and highlight history and art, the history and art of ornamental horticulture. And I wanted to um, show y'all this. This is my Instagram page. I mentioned it in the chat briefly. It's at Conquer the Soil. I sometimes will update it. Sometimes I don't. But if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me. I put that information in the chat. And it's also the last slide. And there are many pictures on here. So there are some stories I didn't share. Um, Joel Elias Springer, another great friend of W.B. Du Bois, who also issued the Springer Medal to Colonel Charles Young, who you saw today. He's in the top right corner. This is a Jewish man who was uh, one of the directors of the NAACP. And also you see Colonel Charles Young in the bottom center, if you notice that. So there's a lot of black horticultural history on my page. That is my currency, but also a lot of the art of horticulture and in these spaces. So I hope this has maybe been helpful to some of you all. And I thank you so much for your time today. And we are going to, it's uh, 227 and we'll get into the group discussion um, moving forward. So I'm gonna take a sip of water and Katrina, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Abra. Um, so any questions or thoughts, you can um, raise your hand or type them directly in the Q&A panel. Do we have any um, ready to go? Because I have a couple questions, follow-up questions to kick us off as well too. Does anyone want to raise a hand and ask a question or just um, type your question? Because I can get started with the, my first question and can go from there. Okay, Abra. Um, oh, yes, someone raised their hand. Uh, let's see, Janelle, do you see who that is? Mayling. Hi, this Hi. is May. Hello. Thank you so very much for your absolutely fabulous presentation and the joy you 
get out of working so closely with uh, their garden and the people and the flowers. We kind of think of it as, as one. Um, where I am in Hawaii, the garden clubs have existed for over a hundred years, but they're firmly owned and run by the society of people who've basically been our, and historically been the oppressor of our people. And we're, we represent native Hawaiians, uh, recapturing, rediscovering and reconnecting with our ancestral lands. So um, what, uh, I just wondered if by starting our own club, our own Native Hawaiian Garden Club, uh, and actually we would be in opposition if we did that to the society of people who never really wanted us there and continually, even today, oppose our plans to uh, save our wetlands in a way that uh, we know as Native Hawaiians, uh, as a place where Native Hawaiians could grow their medicines, their uh, raw material to make uh, goods that we depend on on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. I mean, how, what do you feel about that? Would How would someone like us go about creating a club that would be, you know, uh, I think a, a really big thorn in the side of people who, who really kind of look down on our culture and our people. I, and I hope I'm saying your, your name right. It's Mei Ling, is that right? That's right. Okay. I a thousand percent encourage and advocate for you to start your own club. And I'm gonna tell you why. Everything ain't for everybody. I, and it's okay, it's okay. So I'll give you, um, a good example, I think about, and I'll use my own culture, black uh, fraternities and sororities. I'm not part of a black sorority. So when my girlfriends that are in Delta Sigma Theta go to their meetings, I can't go because I'm not a part of that. And that's okay. It just means that's for them. It's not for me. Find something else to do. So people don't have to, don't or don't let people shame you into having your perspective, your protective space where you want a fellowship with people who are like you and think like you. And I say that because in Hawaii, I think about two things. I mentioned the Negro Garden Club of Virginia earlier. And in their 10th anniversary handbook, I remember one of the black women writing about briefly about Pearl Harbor and how so many of the poinsettias were destroyed in Hawaii. And she was um, hurt by that. And then I also think about, and I'll send you the name if you want me to, if you send me your contact info, there was a Hawaiian orchidist who sent money to the NAACP. This is back in the day now, we are talking about the fifties. This man did not have to do that. He was a native Hawaiian man. He was uh, of the land. And you just have to create your own spaces and protect your own spaces and protect your own culture. You really, really do. And you cannot let anyone shame you for that. And you say, well, how do I start? Get, it is a lot of work to start something on your own. But when you share that lift, if you can get two more people and say, look, it's going to be the three of us. This is where they're going, we're going to do. You start it. And if that means that only Native Hawaiian people can be there, so be it. These Black Garden Clubs were started because they were not allowed into the, the Garden Clubs of Virginia back then. And you don't have to be in just one Garden Club, Mei Ling. If they want to be in the multicultural, everybody's welcome Garden Club, that's, there's a club for that. But if it's Hawaiian Natives only, that's okay because that's your safe space, that's your fellowship, that is how you will be able to uplift each other. And I hope that that's helpful to you, but you absolutely can, and I absolutely believe you should do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question for you, Abra. Um, sure. Going back to Longwood. Um, could you talk a bit more about put Longwood and this fellowship in the historical context of professional development, um, why that would be such a, a big deal. And then what were you hoping to get out of your experience? Um, and then how do you think you impacted that, that space? Okay, um, and should I stop sharing my screen now before I answer that? Oh, yeah. no, <laughs> okay, um, with Longwood, 
okay, the first part of your question was, just repeat that part before me so I can do it um, in order. So can you kind of place Longwood, give it a little background context sure. in terms of, okay. you know, what would, you know, a fellowship at Longwood, is that a big deal? If so, why? And yeah. It is. So this is a leadership and public horticulture fellowship. And I didn't explain that deeply at all in my presentation, because that could be a presentation on its own. It is a program that was started decades ago. And by decades ago, I mean, 70 years ago. So there are Longwood fellows all over the world. And it is a global network of horticultural professionals. And so what that does is it prepares you to lead in this field. So things that now I was great teaching Deborah about whatever plan ID. But if someone had said, talk about nonprofit financing, talk about negotiation at the table, talk about um, they even brought in our own stylist, uh, talk about strategic management. I didn't learn that stuff at Auburn and I didn't learn it at the job. And Longwood is what taught me that. They sent me to Northwestern to learn nonprofit finance. They sent me to the University of Michigan for a week or so to uh, study strategic development and, and planning. And so what Longwood has done is if any doors existed for me anymore, I don't even know it anymore. They've put me in rooms that I didn't even know existed in my life. And it took me probably that point in my career to understand there are levels in this game. And Longwood is a group that sits at the top of public horticulture. So what that means is that when we get into those rooms, we need to uplift and bring other people in. So we have to share and speak names. So part of Longwood, an example of how it was effective, the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, they knew I was a Longwood fellow. They had reached out to me. They kept a relationship with me after my fellowship program. Back in January, they said, or maybe it was actually, Katrina, I think it was last fall. It may have been last fall. And they said, we are looking for more designers of color. Do you know anyone? Um, because we want to make our show more multicultural. We've been working towards that and they've been doing a wonderful job. And they said, do you have any recommendations? And I said, there's a woman I know named Wamboy Ippolito. I think she is a fabulous designer. She's already doing celebrity gardens. She is a phenomenal horticulturist. She studied at NYBG, East African Prowl. And I think this is somebody that would work great with you. Didn't think of it again. Wamboy got in touch with them. I gave a name, they got in touch with her. And here we are, last week, Wamboy won the PHS show. She won the top prize for that show. So in 192 years, this is the first black woman, the first person of color to win. So it was my responsibility as a Longwood fellow that had been brought into the room to just pass a name along. Sometimes that's all it takes. I didn't know she was gonna go win and best in show and all these other medals that went along with it. I just said, Wamboy Ippolito, here's her email, bye. And excuse myself from the conversation. And that is the type of thing that happens. So we have an obligation to, to get in these rooms and to speak up and to bring other people into these spaces. And Longwood, because they're at such a high level, it took the middleman out of my life. I, if I wanna call somebody in New Zealand that runs a botanical garden or the Royal Horticulture Society in London or, or the UK, I can do that now. And Longwood allow that for me and help me to understand how to cut out the middleman and get to the top, get to the decision maker so that I could bring other people with me. So it was very, very, it changed my life, Katrina. It, it's why I'm talking to you, to be honest. Smithsonian didn't call me till Longwood came around now. I was just sitting down here in Georgia, <laughs> minding my country little business, but Longwood has brought me to you today and I'm grateful. I'm glad that Cindy reached out, um, Abra, for that conversation. So we have a hand up, if we unmute please, um, Janelle. Hi, how are you? Hi. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We appreciate it. Um, I am interested in figuring out how to get um, students, young learners, um, especially those who are like elementary level, even middle school level, interested in um, doing uh, design using you know plants and different things I, I feel like we're definitely in ward seven and eight considering plants and farming and doing those types of things but understanding that this is art and how can we encourage um, this to be an extension of art for us when it's something that we've done in our past but it's not necessarily something that has been encouraged or taught I feel consistently for young learners. So how do we encourage them? And are there, I'm always asking, 
Are there programs, are there grants that we can bring to our school um, that encourage this type of, you know, but this type of idea and, and, and change in perspective? There, I, I, I will tell you in all honesty, I don't know the programs or grants off the top of my head. What I do know is that something always exists. Are you in the DC area? You said Ward yes. 8? Okay. So I live I would, in Ward 8. In okay. Okay. So Ward 7. Yes. I would start, mm -hmm. this is what I would do. Remember I told you Longwood showed me, don't talk to the middleman, go to the top. DC has the United States Botanical Garden, right? That's what you have there. And mm -hmm direct outreach to them um her name is missing me right now but i know that woman that garden is led by two women two very uh uh women that are very responsive and that are very engaged in the community one of them is named susan pill um and i want to say maybe she's the assistant director and she is the type of person that would know in your area what type of grants are available because it's the United States Botanical Garden. You really don't get much higher than that in this country. And so, and it's taxpayer funded. So we can hold them responsible and say, hi, I have a question. I wanna get children interested in the art of horticulture. Help me, direct me to the right resource. There's also the extension service. And the trick with the extension is that you have to be hyper-specific with them. They'll send you to the chicken expert when you really wanna to get to the garden design expert. So with the University of Maryland, there are, um, I know there's a woman named Naomi Sachs who is a landscape architecture professor there that's been very responsive to me. What I'm saying is that even though she doesn't know, she would, we would all know somebody that knows somebody. So even though I'm telling you, I don't know, I'm giving you two people that will let's ask them because within our circle, we hold us responsible for having the answer for you and not just saying, oh, um, I don't know. That's not an acceptable answer. The other thing you asked about the children, let them know that it is the art of horticulture. So I showed you bits and pieces of my Aunt Lois's garden and children are so smart. They're so engaged. Explain to them that food can be edible and it can also be displayed beautifully. You can have a beautiful farm. You, your community garden don't have to just look raggedy out there. It can be beautifully laid out. And vernacular gardening is a thing. And black people, people of color, immigrants have long used the resources at hand meaning whatever resources they had, you saw my Aunt Lois's greenhouse there to create their own garden. So let them know, what do you have around you? If all we have are these twigs outside, this natural stone, these extra cans, what are we gonna make? And you can say it's yard art, right? Cause it is art and just explain it to them that way. And I think that you may be surprised at what they come up with, encourage them to decorate their pots, encourage them to try different combinations and let them know some things aren't gonna work and that's okay. But I think you just have to bring the art out of people. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Other raise your hand, you can type your question in the Q and A. And I, I, the last um, I, is, I, it may be Galen, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but I do see someone in the comments put that they have a contact, Janelle. Not just somebody, a top dog today. Janelle said that she has a contact, so wonderful. So we will hopefully get you to where you need to go. Um, and I will also say use art books. There's not necessarily a garden book laid out maybe for kids, maybe there is, but just art books in general and be creative and that will be resourceful to the children as well. Also, there's some uh, local, there's some documentaries, maybe could you might remember some of these, but there were some documentaries I know I've seen on local um, DC, Black DC um, people in, in urban neighborhoods who actually got interested or someone like turned on a light um, to them to horticulture work and how much that has helped them in their life. And I think that would be inspiring to students um, to see that. I don't know if Katrina, you know what I'm talking about, but I know I've seen something. So there was City of Trees, is it City of Trees? Um, looking it, at City of Trees um, is a doc from well, a couple of years ago now. Um, I think it was Casey Trees and another organization was working with um, Ward 7 and 8 residents. Yeah, You can look that up and pass that on. Yeah. And so Casey Trees is another nonprofit working um, in the city that might have, if, could be able to connect you to a person or a group that can also provide some information and resources for you. Casey Trees. 
And y'all, I didn't know that Susan Pell was on the call. And I just want to <laughs> say hello, because she's so amazing. And I said, she's responsive. And Lordy B, if she didn't go on and respond. So I really meant that. And she is one of the women that showed me the way. Let me tell y'all how I met her. I have to say this because she is a big deal in public horticulture, even though she's going to be humble. I don't have to be humble on her behalf. I can big her up. I was sitting minding my business in a hotel lobby at the American Public Gardens Association conference. And Susan Pell just came, sat next to me, started talking to me, wanted to just be friendly. And then she passed me her card. And I, I could have just dropped the card. It was just like, I can't believe this is who you are. I didn't know who I was talking to. So the public garden world is also a small world. And that's why I meant we can reach out to each other. We can, I worked in extension. You can hold people responsible to get back with you. And someone is willing to do it. And it's actually a pretty friendly world. You can't call the record company and get in touch with Beyonce. But here you go, Susan Pell, top 10 easily in our world. And she's on the call. So thank you for being so amazing. Any other questions? Because I have a couple on brewing in my mind, in my head as well. And this kind of builds on our last question um, and a theme throughout your conversation. And so going back to you know, the parties um, where people were either studying engineering or they were athletes and they thought you were a bit strange outside of your clipboard <laughs> and the rain and your yeah. scarf. So why do you think there was this kind of disconnection? Why is she so strange? Why does she want me outside? Why is she this, this agricultural stuff? Why was it, okay, I'm going to be an engineer or I'm going to play sports or what other careers where, you know, people want to talk to you about parties until, you know, Mrs. Obama starts her garden and then they want to buy you a drink at the party. So what do you think that kind of like, oh, that's weird. Why would you want to be involved in that? Looking at the history, the expertise and the artisanship that is just part of the legacy of African-American um, or other um, immigrant communities, our groups who have basically been caretakers and stewards of the land in many ways over time. Why do you think there was this kind of like, hmm, why was that such a strange career path according mm -hmm. to everyone else versus being an engineer, right? In your opinion, your experience. I think that it was timing, Katrina. And what I mean by that, so I was in Auburn from 97 to 2002. That was, I talked about Southern hip hop, but you had, MTV, whatever, Total Request Live, you had Puff Daddy out here with Biggie and Tupac. You, you get, it was just really this age of, in, in, at least in my community, my world of flashiness and Jordan. And it was just the, the rise of, I would say, very in your face wealth and access. And I think that to my friends, it looked like I was hustling backwards. There was an easier way now. There was a quicker way. There were people making money all around me. And it looked like, but you want to just go hoe in the dirt, huh? And now it's a cool thing, but all it takes is someone to make it look cool. So what I'm saying is look at what Serena did to tennis and how she and Venus made it look cool. And now you have so many black and brown women out here, not just playing, winning tournaments, major tournaments. So I think it's just exposure and not knowing. And it went from, I would also say, if we're putting it in a historical context, if we're being honest as we should be, 1968, the civil major civil rights bills are passed or around that time. So black students aren't necessarily having to just go to Tuskegee anymore. Now they can go to Auburn. And I'm one of those students that made that choice. And when you're surrounded by your own people, you see landscape architects, you see black women owning nurseries and greenhouses. You see a lot of things going on. And then all of a sudden it's like the record stops. And then we go into spaces where we weren't necessarily once able to go into and we don't have that framework and support and structure. So I'm thinking I'm the only one, but if I had gone to Southern, like the four in, in Tuskegee, like the four other black arborists who were with me at the city of Atlanta, I would have known, oh, it's a ton of us that do this, but I didn't know. At Auburn, I thought I was by myself. So I think that it was just this idea of the timing of it in America and, and the flashiness of the career, what was cool at the time, and then also not having that historical context around me at Auburn and being in isolation and, and not knowing that I was doing something that there were a lot of people doing. It just wasn't mainstream per se. Other questions? And someone asked us, we will be making this recording available um, next week. So I will send a link out to all the attendees so you can go back and listen to it again as well. That was a question. Any other questions or comments before I ask my other question? I don't want to hog the platform, but no need to be shy. So 
So I'm gonna, um, the question about um, park space. So you show those beautiful images of Atlanta and being a very green city and the, your, your father taking you to these kind of beautiful locations and the cemetery and just kind of having it be a part of your experience, not really realizing how you're being impacted um, or influenced or shaped. And so can you talk a little bit about how these spaces are used, who has access, is, is there equal access to all these various spaces? Um, and you know, is there is it an active use? Is it a passive use? Is there any tension around who has access to these spaces? And has that changed over time in terms of your your childhood to now? Um, how people interact with their green spaces? Are there any tensions around that? Or is there a rediscovery of green spaces? Yes, and I'm gonna cough quickly. I don't want to do it in the microphone. Give me one. In terms of access, and, and I showed you, I grew up always thinking and knowing and believing I had access because I grew up a one minute walk from a park in Atlanta. It had two natural waterfalls in it, Adams Park. And my dad definitely showed me my access and also my mom. And I also realize now looking back that that was a very hyper unique and specific situation. Perhaps if I had grown up in Fort Collins, Colorado, where I showed y'all or Wyoming, where I showed you the picture with my classmates, I wouldn't have known that I had that level of access. So for me, what I think the name was Christian Cooper, what he experienced um, Bird and Wild Black in Central Park, New York. I've never experienced that because in my green spaces, there were always people that looked like me. Now, yes, there is gentrification going on in Atlanta, even in my mom's own neighborhood. And I do notice feeling like, wow, and noticing that and wondering, am I going to be continued to be accepted and maybe even safe in these spaces? And I don't know, I don't have the answer. And it's something I'm hyper aware of where up until, I'm sorry, that's my alarm going off. Up until three years ago, I don't know that I was even aware to be aware in nature. I just knew it belonged to me and I knew it was mine. And so I think that it's dot, dot, dot to be continued. I, I just don't know. Um, I understand that I had a lot of privilege, a lot of black privilege around me. Let me be very clear. I was in a very middle-class and very, in a very acceptable social circle of Atlanta to be able to do that. I can't speak for the kids that grew up in the book bluff, right? I was part of a successful farming family. So I have to own, and I think that we also need to have that conversation. And I'm talking about, oh, black culture this, but there are privileges within individual cultures. So I'm giving you this wonderful Longwood Gardens, but I had the financial means to take a year off of my career to just say, by extension, I'm going to Longwood and come back and start my own business. And that's just not feasible for a lot of people. So I think that we have to own the level of privilege as well that is necessary to set you up for success in environmental careers. Because if you're just coming off the street, it can be quite hard to do that. So that's like a whole other presentation and conversation, maybe not a presentation, but a very tough one that I think we have to have within our industry. How do we make it that you don't have to come from such privilege to be successful in this field? We have a question um, from Ashley. Other than your family's home and land, have there been other physical spaces where you felt most comfortable and matched in terms of your background, the history of the space place? Um, definitely Oakland Cemetery where I showed y'all. It is my complete jam where horticulture and history mix along with art, it is beautiful. And also Chateau Villandry in France. I thought that I was probably gonna be this outsider there. I wasn't French. Henri was my boss. He was the great grandson of Joaquin Carvalho who founded the place. Um, just the fact that his name is Henri, he's so French. And I thought, they're gonna just put me in a closet somewhere and just say, do your work, bye. But my deep engagement, because I was so into history, that was, was exciting for them. And I felt at home at Chateau Villandry. I was continents and time zones away from home, but I felt like I was right at home there because we shared a similar interest. So I think that's another thing about horticulture, environmental fields. You don't have to shy away from your hyper-specific interest. Someone will straight nerd out with you. And the most nerdy thing you can do is probably also gonna be the most profitable thing you can do. So it is a field where your acceptance is really in many ways your individuality. It's not that you're a farmer, it's that I grow the best cherry tomatoes this side of the Mississippi. Like that is what your claim to fame is, your calling card. So I think that that's one thing about um, horticulture that, that gave me access was having these super specific interests and in sticking with it. 
We have a question from Rodney. Um, hi, Dr. Burton, good to see you. Um, are you affiliated with Master Gardeners or Master Gardeners programs? And would you be willing to speak to us? Um, so happy to hear the history knowing um, we do derive that as inspirational ideas that are longstanding in life and in horticulture. Thank you so much. Yes, I do speak. Master Gardeners were the first and the original people that heard all these Black history stories. I tell you, you can see a few of the pictures behind me today. And um, also seniors, the, 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 the elders were the ones who even gave me this information in the first place because you couldn't find it on Google back then. So the answer is yes, I do speak to Master Gardeners and Master Gardener programs. Um, and I am absolutely happy to connect with you. And I genuinely mean that. And for anybody else that's on the call that may be young listening to this, Again, back to that privilege, master gardeners may not have the financial means to pay you what a long wood can. So we still have a professional and a social obligation to step in and speak to those groups that may not have the financial means because we want part of access means that everybody gets it. And it can't just always be, well, you can't meet my high fee here. So sorry, master gardeners, you're on your own. So we have to be each other's keeper and we have to make space for people in smaller groups that may not have the means of a Longwood or Chateau B laundry. I just wanted to say that to be clear, just in terms of that, that privilege talk I was saying. So I want y'all to show I'm about it. I'm not just saying it. <laughs> Mayling, do you have another question? Your hands raised. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, we work uh, on the island of Hawaii, in the largest wetland in the state of Hawaii, and I'm talking 600 acres, but our particular curators of 12 of those acres, and yesterday we we're just talking about designing the planting of native trees there, and up until now we we're just planting native trees, ground covers, shrubs, but we never really thought about a design behind that, um, we use the ancient technique of uh, what we call kipuka or growing plants in uh, segregated areas, but that doesn't create a design. And so my question to you is, have you ever used design in uh, reforestation? Or do you know of anyone who's used design behind I, I cannot personally say that I've used design uh, for reforestation. I, when I was a municipal arborist, I had a different responsibility. And the, 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 answer, is, the answer is yes to you. Yes, there are people that do that. Um, again, because these fields are so hyper-specific, you can start with forestry. So there are forestry departments. And I don't know what even the University of Hawaii has, but you got the whole state of California that even though they're not necessarily close, they're close in the proximity of that may be your fastest, quickest, best access to who can answer some deforestation questions for you. You got UC Berkeley there, you've got all kind of different universities that have access to that answer. So yes, it is done. I have never done it. And there is someone that can lead you to that. Also the, the Department of Forestry with the United States, that's another one, the Extension Service, and sometimes you got to hit people with the trifecta email, but you will get an answer. You will get a response. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Abra, I want to ask you um, in closing, are there any other individuals, organizations that you want to kind of um, give a platform to? Whose work you've been watching, you think they're really engaging, and that others should know about their work um, and their engagement with various community members, community groups? Um, just to kind of anyone you want to spotlight and push out further into the world. Other people that are doing um, the work in communities, wow. Um, there, I, I think that I've just become more aware. I'll tell you who's doing it right is certainly the food people, the urban farmers, urban agriculture. They completely have their act together. I can own, because I'm part of public horticulture, we, we don't have our act together. And I do know that we are actively working to get it together. And I'm bringing up Susan again, because I, I see the realness. And again, meeting me, not knowing me, also, I didn't tell y'all that we ended up going down to DC having a meeting. Sahara Moon is the boss lady there um, with Susan and Sahara Moon. Um, and just those women bringing us in in fellowship. So I say that women, Mary Lynn Mack, 
who is the COO of the Coastal Botanic Garden. She is doing wonderful work. That is, uh, and I think that she identifies as multicultural, biracial, a black woman as well out there in California. So I'm just thinking of the women around me, Sharon Loving um, at Longwood Gardens. And I know these aren't community groups, but I just want y'all to know that these aren't women that got to the top and said, you know what, figure it out on your own, sister. I got here on my own, too bad for you. These are women that brought me in and said, you deserve to be here. You're in this room. I'm going to put you on too. And I'm not just saying pick up the phone and call me. I'm saying put me on to financial work. Shout out Susan Pell again, like making sure checks get cut to me, making sure that I'm financially supported. So I have to uplift and, and thank women in public horticulture for that. So those few names that I gave you, and, and I know that there are many more that probably are escaping me right now. So sorry about that. And we have another question from Susanna. How could universities and organizations better incorporate traditional knowledge into courses and programming? Now on the flip side, how can students learn more on traditional knowledge if the university does not center it? Because remember, it's really great. You mentioned the book your mother showed you, mm -hmm. right? And like the fact that you never, you don't know where the book is and that fact was not taught in at the university where it actually occurred. So how can universities and organizations better incorporate traditional knowledge into courses and programming and how can students actually access this if the university does not center it? That's a great question. Because uh, I worked at a university. Universities have to get out of their own way with their red tape. And it's not always the person in charge's fault. Sometimes, many times, it's this system has been this way for 50 years and this is just the way we do it. And it is honestly ridiculous. So keeping it real with you, your students, they're going to have to teach themselves. The people that I talked to you about today, I didn't learn any of those people at a university. I didn't learn any of those people from uh, other teachers teaching me besides my mom. I actively sought that on my own. And again, one-on-one -on -one conversation with people, older people who were able to tell me about Thomas Queen, this black man that their granddaddy had told him about, and oftentimes older white people. So you don't know what people know. And we have to ask questions of each other. Um, it. And, and, and that's my, also, I think my pitch about being self-taught and how my great grandfather was and how he was a self-taught agrarian. It's so easy to just follow the formula and it's so much harder to seek new information and to, to think that it's just gonna come directly from the university that easily, I don't, I don't see that as a possible route. I think that they're just gonna have to embrace teaching themselves and knowing that people will help them get there. People helped me. Once I was clear on what I wanted to learn, black garden history, specifically ornamental history, the gates open. So I would say your students speak it into existence and then start finding people that have found their own path and go that way. But skip the system. It's going to take too long. Last call for questions or comments. Okay, April, okay, first of all, I was so excited for today, but um, this is our first conversation last year. And so thank you for such a not only engaging, but powerful, just heartfelt um, conversation. And I really enjoyed getting to know you, your family history, um, but it's a practical exploration of your, your basically your journey um, through building your career, but also I would say finding your, your passion, but also connecting to your personal um, history and legacies and how that really plays a role in not only how you, how you work, but also how you teach and engage. So very, very happy to have you um, join the Well Network and I will be tapping you on your shoulder gently um, for more collaboration, but thank you so much for um, sharing your part of your day uh, with us. And for our attendees, thank you for spending um, a portion of your Saturday with us. Um, so next, July 10th is our next lecture. You've already met our, our, sp our speaker, um, Elaine Isaacs will be joining us um, this time with her, um, her organization. So July 10th, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're pushing it back one out from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, the title is Malama Aina, Caring for and Nurturing the Land. So Elaine's mentioned some of the work that they're doing on Oahu um, and restoration around Kuan Nui Marsh. So a bit more about our organization's approach, our focus on education, research, and active stewardship from um, the lens of traditional Hawaiian culture. And so really, I was at a powerful, moving, very kind of exciting work they're doing in terms of engaging community on Oahu. And so the conversation continues July 10th. So please, if you can, please join us. Um, Abram, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Janelle, once again, thank you so much for um, producing the show. We'll see you all tomorrow. Sorry, see you all July 10th for our lecture from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Abra. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Janelle. Bye. Bye, Susan. Bye, Maylene. Bye.
Thank you.